Thank you very much. So, nice to be with you. America continues to gain ground in the war against the virus. I want to thank the American people for answering the call, following our guidelines, and making the sacrifices required to overcome this terrible threat. More aggressively, we commit to social distancing. So important. Social distancing, such an important phrase. And we do it right now. The more lives we can save and the sooner we can eventually get people back to work, back to school, and back to normal. And there are large sections of our country probably can go back much sooner than other sections. And we're obviously looking at that also. People are asking, is that an alternative? I say, absolutely, it is an alternative. I have now approved major disaster declarations for New York, California, Washington, Iowa, Louisiana, Texas, and Florida. That has great significance, as you know, and legal significance. We're in a constant uh, uh, grouping, and I, I can say this, we have a large grouping of people that does nothing but communicate with uh, the various officials, including uh, we've been spending a lot of time with New York officials because that really is by far the hottest spot. They've got uh, a number of very tough weeks ahead of them. The governor's doing a very good job. I spoke to the governor, Governor Cuomo, last night and this morning. And he mentioned that uh, in his remarks that he's using the — that we are using, and I think he feels, because he understands negotiation, he thinks we're using uh, very appropriately the Defense Production Act. And we are. We're using it where needed. It's a great point of leverage. It's a great negotiating tool. But I've really — I will tell you, there's tremendous spirit from people and tremendous spirit with respect to uh, these companies. And I don't have to use it very much at all. They want to do it. As you know, uh, General Motors is involved, Ford's involved, 3M's involved, others are involved, and they're all working very hard to produce product — different — all different products. Uh, we had uh, very little product when we came. We built it up, and we've — we give it away as fast as we can to the different states. We're also, as you know, building numerous hospitals and medical centers uh, throughout certain areas in New York. It's at the Convention Center, the Javits Convention Center. We're doing uh, four hospitals, and we're doing, throughout the state, four medical centers there, somewhat different. I want you to know that I'm uh, doing everything in my power to help the city pull through this challenge. I'm working very hard in New York. It's really, uh, by far, our biggest problem. Maybe it will be, maybe it won't be. But there's a lot of good, capable people working on it with us, and our teams are working very well with the state representatives. Uh, we're also doing some very large testings throughout the country. Uh, I told you yesterday that uh, in South Korea, and this is not a knock in any way, because I've uh, — I just spoke with President Moon. We had a very good conversation about numerous other things. Uh, but uh, they've done a very good job in testing. But we now are doing more testing than anybody by far. We do more in eight days than they do in eight weeks. And uh, we go up on a daily basis exponentially. So it's really good. Uh, by the way, while I'm on it, I also spoke with Prime Minister Abe of Japan last night, and I congratulated him on a wise choice. I think it's going to be a fantastic Olympics 2021. I think it's going to be a fantastic Olympics. It was the absolute right decision to delay it for a full year and now have a full, beautiful Olympics. It's going to be uh, very important because it's uh, probably the first time, maybe ever or certainly in a long time, that it was on a uh, odd year. It's always on an even year, they tell me. Uh, but he's going to have a fantastic success, and now they'll have even more time. He didn't need any more time. Everything was perfectly ready. What a job they've done. But Japan, I want to congratulate Japan, the IOC, and uh, Prime Minister Abe on a great decision. I think it's going to be a fantastic Olympics. I told him I'll be there. I'll be there. 
As we fight to protect American lives, we're also protecting American livelihoods. Democrats and Republicans in the Senate are very close to passing an emergency relief bill for American workers, families, and businesses. This legislation, in addition to the two bills I signed this month, that includes, uh, as you know, sick leave, and we have all sorts of things in for the workers, for families. Uh, but we have a, a tremendous paid sick leave provision for workers at uh, no cost at all to the employers. And that's a big thing, no cost to the employers. We want to get everybody back working. Uh, together, this $2.2 trillion legislative package is bigger than anything I believe ever passed in Congress. Uh, perhaps, uh, relatively speaking, uh, if you go back, look during the FDR New Deal days, there was something that, if you time value it, you could say it was bigger. I don't know. But this is certainly, in terms of dollars, by far and away the biggest ever ever done, and that's a tremendous thing because a lot of this money goes to jobs, 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 and families, families, families. The Senate bill, as you know, includes $350 billion in job retention loans for small businesses with loan forgiveness available for businesses that continue paying their workers. They continue paying their workers. That's what we want. We want them to keep their workers and pay their workers. This will help businesses keep workers in the payroll and allow our economy to quickly accelerate as soon as we defeat the virus. $300 billion in direct cash payments will be available for every American citizen earning less than $99,000 per year. That would be $3,400 very quickly for the typical family of four. Nothing like that's ever been done in our country up to $250 billion in expanded unemployment benefits. The average worker who has lost his or her job will receive 100 percent of their salary for up to four full months. Unlike normal unemployment benefits, independent contractors and the self-employed will be eligible. So you have independent contractors and self-employed people will be eligible for this. Over $100 billion to support the Heroic work of our doctors, nurses, and hospitals. They've been incredible. $45 billion for Disaster Relief Fund. So we are setting up a fund of $45 billion for disaster relief. That's more than doubling the amount available to support my national emergency and disaster declarations. It's a doubling up. $27 billion to build up the strategic national stockpile with critical supplies, including masks, respirators, pharmaceuticals, and everything you can imagine, because it was uh, very depleted, like our military was depleted. Now we have a brand new military. Never had a military like this. We have uh, equipment either coming or it's uh, already come. For the most part, it's already come, but we have a lot of things that will soon be coming. Planes, missiles, rockets, lots of things. But the uh, stockpile was very depleted, like everything else. This will also include significant funding for the development of vaccines on top of the $8 billion we approved several weeks ago. Over $500 billion in support for the hardest hit industries with a ban on corporate stock buybacks, which is something I insisted on. And frankly, I tell you, the Republicans uh, wanted that, and the Democrats wanted that. We want them to use the money for the companies and the planes or whatever they may be helping to get over this rough patch. And I don't think it's going to end up being such a rough patch. I think it's going to, when we open, especially if we can open it, the sooner the better, it's going to open up uh, like a rocket ship. I think it's going to go very good and very quickly. And you're going to have some tough new limits on executive compensation also. They need the money. Uh, they're going to have to sort of just make things work, because we're interested in the workers, the jobs. And we're interested in the companies, because that's really what what fuels the workers in those great jobs. And we also have $16 billion in funding for the purchase of personal protective equipment. You know about that, such as masks and respirators through the Strategic 
national stockpile. I encourage the House to pass this vital legislation and send the bill to my desk for signature without delay. I will sign it immediately. We will have a signing, and it'll be a great signing and a great day for the American worker and for American families and, frankly, for American companies, some of which were having the best years they've ever had these last few years. And then a little bit less than a month ago, uh, they went into a position that they haven't seen because of the hidden enemy, the virus. Earlier today, I spoke to the leaders of many of America's amazing nonprofit organizations. I thank them for their unwavering and unwavering devotion to American people, to American families, to our nation. And uh, they have been fantastic. They've been collecting supplies, distributing food, supporting healthcare workers, caring for vulnerable workers and families. I encourage them to continue to do it. But I'll tell you, the nonprofits have been fantastic. They've been great. They're great people, actually. I know a lot of them. Finally, I want to provide a brief update on the critical supplies. Through FEMA, the federal government has delivered or is in the process of shipping 9.4 million N95 respirators. Think of that, 9.4 million. 20 million surgical masks, and we have others that we think are going to be delivered pretty quickly. The whole world, you know, it's not just us, it's not just the states. The whole world is trying to get these things So, com in competition with many, many countries. I believe today you broke the 150 mark for the virus. We have 150 countries, over 150 countries, where you have this virus. And uh, nobody would ever believe a thing like that's possible. Nobody could have ever seen something like this coming. But now we know, and we know it can happen and happen again. And if it does, somebody's going to be very well prepared because of what we've learned and how we've done. It's been incredible how we've done. Remember, there's more tests than anybody by far. And uh, the news, the reporters, the media it always likes to bring South Korea. They called me and they told me, it's amazing. Your testing procedures are amazing. Plus, we have a test that's a very high-level test, and it's a test that's very accurate. 3.1 million face shields, 2.6 million surgical gowns, 14.6 million gloves, and almost 6,000 ventilators, which go to the areas of greatest needs. We sent, uh, over the last day, 4,000 ventilators to New York. And I spoke with uh, the governor about that. He was happy. I spoke with the mayor also about that, Mayor de Blasio. He was very happy. It's hard not to be happy with the job we're doing. That I can tell you. Throughout this national emergency, everyday heroes continue to step forward and demonstrate the extraordinary character of our nation, including the people behind me. By the way, these people are amazing. They are amazing people, and they become I don't know, maybe I should just speak for myself, but to me, they become friends. Maybe they don't like me. Maybe they don't. Maybe they do. I don't know. All I can tell you is they're, they're talented people. They work very hard. In Maryland, a seven-year-old boy used his own birthday money to buy meals for dozens of senior citizens. In Nevada, a college student recruited 90 of her friends to help deliver groceries and supplies to the most vulnerable. This is happening all over the country, thousands and thousands of instances. I could stand up here all day and tell you about other things. In Minnesota, hundreds of medical students have volunteered to provide child care for hospital workers, helping to keep our doctors and nurses on the front lines, fighting to save lives. These inspiring Americans remind us that we all have a role to play in winning this great national battle, and it's really a worldwide battle. We're dealing with other nations all the time. The people here are — I am a little bit. I take calls from a lot of people. They're in trouble. A lot of countries are in big trouble. So now uh, we will hear from our great Secretary of the Treasury. He's been working rather hard, I will tell you. Steve Mnuchin is a — is a — fantastic guy, and he loves our country, and he's been dealing with uh, both sides, Republican and Democrats. He sort of lived over in that beautiful building. It's a very beautiful building. To me, one of the most beautiful buildings, actually, in the world. And he's gotten to know it, Steve, very well. So if we could have a little update, Steve, it would be fantastic as to how we're doing and what it's looking like. Thank you.
But thank you very much, Mr. President. And first, let me say I would like to thank Mitch McConnell for his leadership, and I'd also like to thank Chuck Schumer for the enormous bipartisan support we had on this bill, and the many senators, both Republicans and Democrats, that worked tirelessly over the last five days on, on all the task force. As the President said, uh, I got to live in the LBJ room uh, for the last five days, and we couldn't be more pleased with the unprecedented response from the Senate to protect American workers and American business uh, in this situation. The President has outlined many of these, but let me just quickly go through them. Again, small business retention loans. This will cover roughly 50 percent of the private payroll in small businesses, where we will immediately make loans that will supply eight weeks of, of salaries as long as they keep workers employed and overhead. And uh, those loans will be forgiven at the end of the period as long as they keep workers employed. Uh, these are SBA loans, but the Treasury will be issuing new regulations authorizing almost every single FDIC-insured bank to make these. Uh, I expect by the end of next week, we will have a very simple process where these can be made and dispersed in the same day. So uh, this will be a very simple system to get money into small business hands. Um, for companies that don't uh, qualify that, we have a uh, economic program of uh, tax incentives to retain workers. And as the President said, we have enhanced unemployment insurance for people who don't fit into these two programs that will be administered through the states. Uh, we also have economic imp inc impact payments. These will be, within the next three weeks, direct payments into most people's deposit accounts. And for those that don't have it, uh, we will be having the, the checks in the mail. Uh, Treasury will have uh, additional authorities. We have $500 billion that we can use to work with the Federal Reserve for emergency programs that will create up to an additional $4 trillion, if needed, to support American business and American workers in an unprecedented way. And then finally, the President mentioned uh, $100 billion to hospitals and $150 billion to states that have specific coronavirus expenses. Uh, as well as many additional things. Mr. President, I especially want to thank you and the Vice President. You were constantly available to us. Uh, we spoke constantly throughout the day. You gave us uh, guidance and quick decisions on many issues. And again, thank everybody for this great bipartisan work. This is going to be enormous help for the American workers and the American economy. The President was very determined that Congress would move swiftly to protect hardworking Americans in business in this unprecedented situation. Thank you very much. Great job. Day and night, right? Day and night. Day and night. We, we was, uh, that was, that was a lot of work. And we'll see how it all goes. We still need a vote, Steve, don't we? Really. Do you have a uh, question? Yes. How long do you think this bill will keep the economy afloat? Hopefully a long time. We'll, we'll see. If we have to go back, we have to go back. We're going to take care of the American worker. We're going to take care of these companies that fuel this country. and make the country great. It's not their fault. It's not their fault. But we think uh, this I would will say three, we've anticipated three months. Hopefully we won't need this for three months. Uh, hopefully this war will be won quicker. But uh, we, we expect that this is a significant amount of money, uh, if needed, to cover the economy. And don't forget, a lot of this is going to be to keep companies that are very strong, AAA-rated companies previously, uh, to keep them going. And it's going to be in the form of loans, so the money's going to come back. This money's got, a lot of this money's coming back. Separately, let me ask you about something you said yesterday. Uh, you said we should never be reliant on a foreign country for the means of our own survival. Yeah. What did you mean? Well, I've been saying that? that for a long that, time. Well, we're reliant on many countries where we uh, give up our supply chains, we give up our factories, we give up our production facilities, and we can buy it someplace else for a little bit lower price. But it's really costing us more when that happens, because we lose jobs, we lose everything, and we lose our independence, and we can't let that happen. So we'll be making some changes. We have been making those changes. Is there an executive order to basically ban the export of medical equipment? I don't know that we'll need that, but I think it's happening by itself. I think a lot of things are happening. Well, some people, we make the best medical equipment in the world, and you have some people, like the uh, European Union, they don't take it because they have uh, specifications 
that don't allow our equipment in because it's designed in a different way. Even though it's a better way, it's designed. They're all, they're all playing games against us, okay? They've been playing games against us for years, and no president has ever done anything about it. But the European Union, you look at medical equipment. We make the best medical equipment in the world, but we can't sell it because — or not appropriately. And yet, we take their medical equipment in our country. We're changing things, Steve. All this is changing. But they have specifications so that our equipment — designed specifically so that our equipment can't come into their countries. It's a very terrible thing that's happened to our country. And let me tell you, some of the people that took the biggest advantage of us are allies. You know, we talk about allies. They took advantage of us in many ways, but financially as well as even militarily. When you look at — look, uh, I got — if you look at NATO, the abuse that was given to our country on NATO, where they wouldn't pay. And we were paying for everybody. We're paying — now, because of me, they're paying a lot. Now they've paid $125, $135 million, billion dollars more. And then, uh, ultimately, Secretary General Stoltenberg, who I think you would say is maybe my biggest fan, we got him to pay an additional $400 billion — billion — other countries. And uh, — but, but, you know, that. And then there's the trade. They make it — they make it almost impossible for us to have a fair deal. They know this. They know I'm just waiting. We have all the advantages, by the way. It's going to be easy when I decide to do it. But this isn't the right time to do it. But we've been treated very, very unfairly by the European Union. Mr. President, uh, four Republican senators uh, have indicated that the extra $600 for unemployment insurance may encourage workers to leave their jobs, even though you can only collect unemployment if you're fired. Curious what you think of that concern. Well, I, I know the issue very well. We talked about it just a little while ago. I'll let — Steve, I'm going to let you maybe discuss that. Sure. Now, the President and I spoke to several of those senators today. But let me just explain the issue, which is we wanted to have enhanced unemployment insurance. Most of these state systems have technology that's 30 years old or older. So if we had the ability to customize this, with much more specifics, we would have. This was the only way we could assure that the states could get money out quickly in a fair way, so we used $600 across the board. And I, I don't think it will create incentives. Most Americans, what they want, they want to keep their jobs. And I said for 50 percent of these, these businesses, they will have the businesses keep those jobs. So this was — our number one issue was how do we make sure that American workers who needed to keep getting paid. This is no fault of their own that businesses have been shut down. The President and Vice President wanted to make sure those hardworking Americans got money. And this was the most efficient way of doing it. Senators that you spoke with, are they in agreement now? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to comment on the specifics of, of, of where they are, but uh, I would say, you know, our expectation is this bill passes tonight and gets to the House tomorrow and they pass it. We need to get this money into the American economy and American workers. That's the, Im the importance of this. I mean, the, one, the one good thing, when you think about that, people could get actually more money. But we don't want to give a disincentive. But they have been talking about that. It's a good question, actually. Yes, ma'am, please. Yes, thank you. The family of — on another subject, the family of retired FBI agent Robert Levinson says that U.S. officials have concluded that he's died in Iranian custody. Are you aware of that? And so, how did U.S. officials yeah, reach that conclusion? Uh, you know, I've been very much involved in that. And he was a great gentleman and a great family. It's just — I mean, I have to say this, and uh, they've been making the statement to the family, I believe, but it's not looking good. He wasn't well for years, anyway, in Iran. Uh, it's not looking promising. We've gotten so many people back. We've got two people back this week. But uh, Robert Levinson, who was outstanding, uh, he was — he's been sick for a long time. Uh, and in, in — uh, he had some rough problems prior to his detainment or capture. And uh, we feel terribly for the family. But — Do you accept that he is dead? No, I don't accept that he's dead. I don't accept it. I mean, I'm telling you, it's not — it's not looking great, but I, I won't accept that he's dead. 
They haven't told us that he's dead. But a lot of people are thinking that that is the case. Feel badly about it. Mr. President, you tweeted earlier linking the closing of the country to your election success uh, in, in November. Is this Easter timeline based on your political interests? What do you mean by election success? No. You said that the media wants the country to remain closed to hurt your no, odds. No, no, I think the re-elected. media. Yeah, no, the media would like to see me do poorly in the election. I think. Sir, I sir, think. Lawmakers and economists I think on both that, sides of the aisle have said that reopening the country by Easter is not a good idea. What is that plan based on? Just so you understand, are you ready? Mm-hmm. I think there are certain people that would like it not to open so quickly. I think there are certain people that would like it to do financially poorly because they think that would be very good as far as defeating me at the polls, and. I don't know if that's so, but I do think it's so that a lot of that there are people in your profession that would like that to happen. I think it's very clear. I think it's very clear that there are people in your profession that write fake news. You do. She does. There are people in your profession that write fake news. They would love to see me for whatever reason, because we've done one hell of a job. Nobody's done the job that we've done. And it's lucky that you have this group here right now for this problem, or you wouldn't even have a country left. Okay, go ahead, Mr. 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 President. Two questions. The first one: Once you sign the two trillion dollar package, how soon or how rapidly do you expect to see? Who, who you with? Who you with? I'm at CBN. Okay. And my second question is: uh, We are hearing you are pushing for April 6th to have direct payments issued to taxpayers. Is that the target date? I think it's uh, again. I, very much, I, I right? would say our expectation is within three weeks. We will have direct payments out where we have depository information, and uh, we're looking to get a lot more information, and we have procedures to do that. So three weeks for that, and I would say the end of next week, we want all the banks to be able to originate loans same day. Thank you, Mr. President. I have two questions for you. One is is that tomorrow you're going to be speaking with the G20 leaders. And I want to know if you're going to lead an effort to craft a worldwide ban on wild animal markets so as to prevent another pandemic, given that COVID-19 is a zoonotic that was transferred to humans in uh, trade of exotic animals. Yeah, I don't know that that subject's going to come up. There is a lot of uh, talk that that's how this all happened, came out of China. And they say that's how it happened in China. Uh, So it's something maybe will be talked about, but it's not the top of my list. Yes, and I think we'll have a very, I think we'll have a very good conference tomorrow. Well, and to follow up. Yeah. Also, and, uh, Dr. Arshi Shah, who is the head of uh, Harvard's Global Health Institute, says that the key to getting this economy open as soon as possible is to test everyone who needs testing so we can quarantine all infected individuals and allow everyone else to go back to work immediately. Would you subscribe to that strategy? No, but I, I, we have tested more than anybody. I, I not, saw him. And if not, how many deaths are acceptable? Yeah. How many? None. Okay. How many deaths are acceptable to me? None. Okay. None. If that's your question. Look, uh, I saw him. I saw his statement. We have tested by far more than anybody. We're testing more than anybody right now. There's nobody even close. And uh, our tests are the best tests. They're the most accurate tests. But if you're saying we're going to test uh, 350 million people, I, I watched his statement. Uh, I disagree with it. We can go to certain states. I could name them now, but I'm not going to do that. But we can go to certain states right now. They have virtually no problem or a very small problem. We don't have to test the entire state in the Middle West or wherever they may be. We don't have to test the entire state. I think it's ridiculous. We don't have to do it. A lot of those states could go back right now, and they probably will, because at some point in the not-too-distant future, Certain states are going to come off the rolls. Maybe New York can't, and maybe California can't. Maybe the state of Washington can't, although if you look at them, their biggest problem was in one nursing home. Yeah, go ahead. But the states aren't silent. And so, I mean, somebody, if you test one state, and then the person moves over to the other state, well, then... Uh, You know, you're going to just look at that. But if you take a look at the states, and many states that I'm talking about, they don't have a problem. We have some big problems, but it's confined to certain areas, high-density areas. So why would we test the entire nation, 350 people? With that being said, I'm going to say it again. We tested far more than anybody else. We are — we have the ability to test — I mean, we've come a long way from an obsolete, broken system that I inherited. We have now tested, with the best test, far more than anybody else. When I say anybody else, I'm talking about other countries. No country is even close. 
They came out with a statistic, uh, I guess, uh, yesterday that I heard from Dr. Burks, where it's for eight, eight days here, more than eight weeks in South Korea. And South Korea's done a good job. But we did in eight days more than South Korea did in eight weeks. That's a big number. And we're getting, I said before, exponentially better. Every day it's going up substantially. We have an incredible apparatus built now. But no, I, I don't want to test 350 million people. I think it's ridiculous. Yes, please. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Two questions. One follow-up on the G20, because the UN asked the G20 countries to do uh, for more resources, for a coordinated stimulus package, ban on tariffs, waive on sanctions, to try to prevent what they call an apocalyptic uh, pandemic. Would you consider those measures? And uh, With respect to what? On, on uh, tariffs and also on, related also to um, to waive tariffs and also Look, uh, we have strong sanctions. borders. Yeah. And uh, would you consider to join this global effort? So before I came here, we weren't into borders. We had a country people could come in. We had a whole different deal. Now we're up to almost 164 miles. Think of that: 164 miles of wall, big, beautiful wall. And in those areas, it's very, very tough to come in. We've been very tough on the borders. I mean, where we have the wall built, we're, nobody's getting through. Now, they're going around, but that's a long trip. If they're going around, that's the way they get through. But, uh, no, I'm very strong on borders, and I don't want people coming in here. I, what I want is if they're going to come in, they have to come in legally. They have to come in through merit. Uh, we're not having the people that you're talking about come into our country. All right. Just Mr. 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 Thanks, sir. Uh, question for you and for, for Dr. Fauci, if you'll let me. Uh, both Republican and Democrat packages of the, the stimulus um, included $25 million worth of funding for the Kennedy Performance Arts Center yeah. here in Washington, D.C. Uh, shouldn't that money be going to masks, respirators? Well, I know what, I approved that. And I knew it was $35 million and we actually took off 10 But I'm a fan of, of that although I haven't spent t time there because I'm far too busy. I'd love to go there evenings, but I'm too busy doing things because that's more important for me than going there. But the Kennedy Center has suffered greatly because nobody can go there. It's essentially closed. And they do need some funding. And I said, look, that was a Democrat request. That was not my request. But you got to give them something. It's something that they wanted. You know, it works that way. The Democrats have treated us fairly. I really believe that we've had a very good back and forth. And I say that with respect to Chuck Schumer. I spoke to him a number of times. Uh, but, you know, they had requests also. So that was a request. There were 35, as you know, and it came down to 25. We got it down to 25. We agreed. I said, that's a lousy t sound bite. That's not a good sound bite. But that's the way life works. With that being said, the Kennedy Center, they do a beautiful job, an incredible job. David Rubenstein does a fantastic job. He's very much involved, and he puts up a lot of money, and he does things that a lot of people wouldn't be able to do or, or do. But they've been essentially closed. They have tremendous deficits that are built up. I mean, this thing has been devastating to it. So I didn't have a big problem with it. But this was a request from the Democrats because of the fact that they have a facility that's essentially closed up. Yeah. Another question, sir. In other words, you couldn't go there if you wanted to. If I wanted to go there tonight to look at Romeo and Juliet, I'd love to see Romeo and Juliet tonight, right? You know what would happen? They say, sorry, 250 people or 50 people, whatever it might be down to. Go ahead. Uh, and then earlier today, Senator Marco Rubio uh, told uh, RCP that, quote, the World Health Organization showed favoritism to China, unquote, and then Representative Michael McCall, the ranking member on the, the House Foreign Relations Committee, uh, he questioned the integrity of the World Health Organization's director, uh, saying, quote, that there were several red flags in his past with respect to his relationship with China. Um, do you agree? Do you think the World Health Organization showed favoritism? And then once all the dust settles, uh, do you think that the United States should uh, re-explore its relationship with the World Health Organization? Well, I think there is a lot of, uh, certainly a lot of talk that has been very unfair. Um, I think that a lot of people feel that it's been very unfair. It's been very, uh, very much sided with China. Uh, and a lot of people are not happy about it. At the same time, Dr. Fauci and myself and other people, there are people on there that we like and we know. A lot of, I think your friends are on there, a lot of good people, a lot of good professionals. I don't know, it'd be interesting 
to hear if you'd like to talk about the world uh, WHO. But the fact is that uh, I have heard for years that that is very much biased toward China. So I don't know. Doctor, you want to, you want me to get you into this political mess? No, I don't want you to do that, but I will. <laughs> um, so uh, Tedros is really a, an outstanding person. I've known him from the time that he was the Minister of Health of Ethiopia. I mean, obviously, over the years, uh, anyone who says that the WHO has not had problems has not been watching the WHO. But I think under his leadership, they've done very well. He has been all over this. I was on the phone with him a few hours ago, leading a WHO call. Pricing China's transparency, no, sir? No, I'm not, I'm not talking about China. You asked me about Tedros. Uh, World Health Organization praising China for its transparency and leadership on their response to the pandemic? You know, I, I can't comment on that because, I mean, I, I don't have any viewpoint into it. I mean, I don't, I don't even know what your question is. I, can, I, can I follow up on that phone call, please? Welcome to the game. <laughs> you know, let, let me just tell you, I've heard that for years. I spoke to him yesterday. Seems fine to me. I don't know. But we're the ones that gave the great response, and we're the ones that kept China out of here. And if we didn't do it, you'd have thousands and thousands of people died, who would have died, that are now living and happy. If I didn't do that early, call on China. And nobody wanted that to happen. Everybody thought it was a uh, just unnecessary to do it. And if we didn't do that, thousands and thousands of people would have died more than what's happened. So that's it. All right, maybe one more. Steve, go ahead. When you have this G20 meeting tomorrow, what sort of coordinated response are you expecting? No coordinated. We're going to have a meeting with the uh, 20 nations total, including us. And there'll be uh, it'll be a conference call tomorrow morning sometime. I look forward to people I know I like. I think in every instance, I like every one of them. Uh, but it'll be an interesting call. You'll be the first to know. And, and next week, when the 15-day period ends, what, what should we expect then? Are you going to extend it for another week? Well, we'll be week? talking. I'll, I'll be speaking. I'll be speaking with Tony. I'll be speaking with Deborah. I'll be speaking with some of the people that they like and respect, and that they're going to bring along with them. Uh, we'll be speaking to uh, Vice President Mike Pence. and. Uh,